Good morning. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. And today we're going to do a special program, a, a retrospective program on one of my favorite people, Judge Samuel P. King. Uh, we have his first daughter, Louise King Lanzalotti. I hope I pronounced yes, it that correctly. Perfectly. Louise, welcome yes, to our program. So great to be here and remember Dad. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I was talking with your your sister Becky a while back about your dad, and uh, a lot of memories and ideas started coming back to me, and it's something that I wanted to do a lot. Uh, we right in front of us, we have a uh, an award that. Uh, the Japan Hawaii Lawyers Association gave to Judge King uh, for all of his help in 1985 uh, to bring Japanese and Hawaii lawyers together. And our first conference that we had was in Hiroshima. Uh -huh. And your dad was the keynote speaker at that conference. Uh, Judge King was very gracious. He, he and your mom, Anne, uh, went with us to Hiroshima. By the way, they, they wanted to stay in a ryokan, a tatami mat right. uh, ryokan, not in an American-style hotel. And he, gave, came, he get, got up and gave the speech, a very moving speech. He talked about being present in Honolulu on December 7th, 1941, when the J Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And he also talked about touring in Hiroshima Yes. About a month after the atomic bomb uh, fell on, on Hiroshima, and he talked a great deal about how lawyers can make a difference and how lawyers can do good things and bring people together. So he gave this great speech, and then he sat down, and people were talking and drinking and having a good time, and, and he and your mom decided, well, wait a minute let's get up on stage and they started to sing Japanese songs <laughs> and dance and they did a great job and that kind of but that tells me a lot about your dad I mean he was very serious yes he knew a lot about contemporary hi history and Japanese things and Hawaiian things but he also had a, a, a kind of a uh, kolohe side or a, a, a humorous side Absolutely. It, he, and and he got up there and it didn't make a difference. He was still well respected, and he could laugh at himself. And and your mom, your mom too. Your mom got up there and, and joined him, and they both had a great time. So I wanted to talk to you about your dad. And what? Tell me, you know, who who was your dad? Tell <laughs> tell, tell me a little bit about him and uh, what, what his background was. You know, I often think of my dad as a person with one foot in each of two worlds. You know, he was a uh, Kanaka Maoli. His both of his parents were part Hawaiian. And he was and a, a proud American and a proud citizen of the world. But he thought that both were important. He didn't give up one for the other. And I think that was really an important thing about Dad. Uh, he had a very interesting life. He was born in China in a, in, in a really interesting circumstance. His father was on a U-boat during, uh, not a U-boat, uh, sorry, a uh, little ship going up and down the Yangtze River rescuing people during World War I. So that's where he like was born. Like a gunship or something. Yeah, a like gunboat. I think I have a picture of it somewhere. But they and so he was born there, and he then so we told him he couldn't be president because he wasn't <laughs> born in China. <laughs> we had great discussions about whether that was legal or not, and and so then he grew up in Hawaii partly, and because his father was delegate to Congress, he partly grew up in Washington right, well, D.C. No, no, and no, wait a minute. many no, other he, places. Okay, so he, he was born in China. Yep. Because yes. his his father was in the navy in World War One, and, and and obviously his mother was there. His mother was there, and they were they were there, patrolling yeah. during World patrolling War a, mm -hmm. patrolling a river in China. Right, and and there's actually a movie called The Sand Pebbles. It's about that exact right, experience. Right, 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 right. and and so uh, and his father was in the navy. So your yes. your granddad was in the navy. Yes, and he how was. did do you know how he got in, how your your grandfather? He was, he was an Annapolis graduate. I see. And so he was in the navy. His father himself was a sea captain. So there, the ocean ran deep in the family. I see. And uh, yeah. Okay. Now he's and he, and he was given the name Samuel P. 
King. What's the P for? Palethorpe was not a family name. It was a friend Pale of the Thorpe. family. Palethorpe. Pale Thorpe. Thorpe. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do you spell that? P A I L T H O R P E. Okay. So that's there a, wasn't I, originally an E, but they added one. I don't know why. It's an uh, it's an unusual <laughs> name. Yes. And but uh, was this a, a friend here? It, it or was a friend that my grandfather looked up to in Hawaii, I believe. I see. Yeah. Okay. So he he was born in China, and yeah. what, how long was he there? And then what happened? Did Not he... long. I think they moved back to uh, to Hawaii, and then also he was a delegate to Congress soon after that. I'm not quite sure what year. So then he was in D.C. when he was very small, also. Your, because your, 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 your grandfather was a, was delegate. a delegate to Congress, right. Okay, so he was involved right. in Hawaiian politics. Yes, he was okay. a delegate to Congress, he was governor, he was various things. But he always went back to either his career in the Navy, he fought in both world wars, or as a real estate person. Okay, that's your granddad. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I want to show a photo of your dad as I saw him when I became a lawyer. Uh, and and that's in his office at yes. the federal court. Uh, I, I actually knew him before he was a federal judge, but uh, I remember often having cases and going in there and, and talking to him about cases with counsel. And then at other times when we talked about the Japan Hawaii Lawyers Association having meetings there, uh, and that was a you know pr pretty interesting office. What can you tell us about? About his office. Well, he liked that photo because, in addition to showing his office, it showed some of his 5,000 books that were kept there. I think my mother said, you know, you can put your books in the office, please. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on many topics, when, when uh, Dad died, we had to pack them up, and they were just on law, but also human behavior and all kinds of traveling things and just really great stuff. And then he had various things on his table, including candy for visitors and photos of the children. A lot of ha Hawaiian uh, yeah. type type things there. So yeah. he took his Hawaiian background seriously. Yes. I, yes, he did. I guess. Okay, so that, 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 that's a photo of kind of the, the end part of his professional ca career when he was uh, uh, a, a senior federal judge. Prior to that, how, how did he get there? What, what was his, you know, background as a child? Where did he go to school? What type of things did he do? He did spend most of his childhood in Hawaii. He uh, went to public school for most of his life, but when he got to eighth grade, uh, he was going to be going to a, an English standard school. And his parents were opposed to English standard schools because they discriminated against Japanese people, for one thing, or immigrants. So his father wouldn't let him go. <laughs> and my grandmother said, well, he has to go to school somewhere. So they applied to Punahou School, and he went there from eighth grade through 12th grade. OK. And you mentioned uh, the discrimination about Japanese. And he, he, I know he had, a, had an affinity for things, things Japanese. And how, how did that begin? Or how did... I, yeah, I think it maybe began with his parents, who were really welcoming to all kinds of people. And uh, he, his father even sent him to Japanese language school when he was a child. They lived in Kaneohe, so after school, what can I do with Sam? I'll send him to Japanese language school. So he actually did learn some Japanese in Japanese language school, which <laughs> most of my friends who are Japanese say, I didn't learn any Japanese in Japanese language school. So that was part of it. You know, and just friends and growing up with all kinds of people, he just fell in love with all things Japanese. Yeah, that, that, uh, I know that. As I told you, when he, we were planning to go to Hiroshima for the 1985 conference, he, he said he, he 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 demanded ryokan that he that he they wanted to yeah. sleep on the tatami mat, and that was that was what they were very interested in. That was their 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 background. So you know the, the fact that he went to uh, Japanese language school as a young boy kind of maybe shaped a lot. I think so. Um, I think it was an influence. I do. And and did he and that that was before he went to Punahou. Yeah, so he didn't go to Punahou till you know he was eight, twelve eight years eight. old. Okay, yeah. so so what happened next in in his uh, when upbringing? he was in high school at Punahou, he another wonderful thing that happened was that he was in a speech contest, a national speech contest, I think sponsored by the newspaper, and newspapers all over the country, and he was one of the finalists. So the the prize was a trip to Europe. Wow. 
so he was able to go to Europe before. Uh, I, I think we have a photo of him uh, when when he left. Uh, there he is. Yeah, with all his lays. <laughs> from I wonder, I guess that's all his family. So that's when he's about to take off as a young high school student. Yeah, I think he was about 17 years old. Mm -hmm. And he got a trip to Europe. Yeah. What, did, did he tell you anything about that? Or? You know, he he did a little bit, but um, it was the beginning of many, many, many trips to Europe. After that, he he loved Europe as well, and he loved traveling. They would spend a lot of time traveling with us or after we were around. So. It, I think it helped spark his love of travel. Okay, all right. So he went off, went off traveling, and what happened? Where, what? Uh, then he, well, my sister tells me that that photo was after the travel and on his way to college, but he oh, did see. go to Yale University on a scholarship. Okay. And uh, he spent four years at Yale and then three years in law school at Yale. So, so he was away from Hawaii for a very long time. A Yale grad, then what happened? And what did he do? Uh, when he graduated, he came back to Hawaii, and he was teaching math at Punahou, I think, and just trying to become a lawyer and everything. And then uh, pretty soon Pearl Harbor happened. Okay. What, what was the result of Pearl Harbor? What, where, what, what happened in your dad's life? Well, he was Pearl there. Harbor? He witnessed Pearl Harbor. He was staying with his, his best friend up in Manoa, and it happened. And he was just shocked. He, he thought that it was just the worst thing they could possibly have done. What a bad idea, you know. And yet it happened. So he tried to uh, volunteer for the Navy, but he only had one eye, which is another very long story. And so he couldn't, couldn't go in the regular service. So he went into naval intelligence. Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go back a little bit mm -hmm. to, to the one eye. Because <laughs> it, 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 uh, what, 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 what's that about? When he was a very small boy, his father was opening a box that they used to send things in really wooden boxes with metal things, and he was hitting some, the nail out, and it flew right into my father's eye, and he lost his eye. But that never sort of stopped fate. him. He always thought it was fate. And he never thought that he was disabled for that, by that. Uh, he thought, well, that got me out of being in Annapolis and getting killed with my class at Annapolis, because that class that he would have been in, a lot of them fought in World War II and didn't survive. Okay. So he found another way to serve in World War II. Wh which was what? Which was in naval intelligence. They wanted him to do uh, Japanese language because he spoke Japanese. So that goes back to yeah. his back dad to sending him to his That's right. Japan uh, That's right. classes right. as a young boy, right. and he knew a little bit of Japanese. He knew a little bit of Japanese, so he went to Boulder, Colorado to study. And on another, on another end of the country, my mother heard about Pearl Harbor. She was 21 years old, I believe. Where was she? Where was she? She was a graduate of Smith College. She was from the East Coast. And uh, she was a linguist. She majored in ancient Greek. No. So she was really smart. She was really smart, right. Yeah. You, you could get into this Japanese language school if you spoke Japanese or if you spoke a lot of languages easily, if you learned languages easily. So she went and looked up Pearl Harbor, and then she volunteered and went into some other things first. But then she applied for the Japanese language school, and she got in. So that's where they met, so, in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, so I'm thinking that this is the start of a love story. Yes, it here. is. And, and so tell us a little bit of the background. Your, your dad wanted to serve, yes. and so he went to the language school. So right. did your mom, Anne. Yeah. She, she wanted to be, and then what happened? I mean, tell, they, tell us the story. They met, and well, the early story was that they only knew each other for three weeks. I think they had seen each other before that, but they knew each other for three weeks. And after that time, my father said to her on some picnic up in the mountains, how would you like to live in Hawaii? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, I, I, what are you asking me? <laughs> so he finally got around to asking her to marry him. And she said, I'll tell you on Wednesday. All right, now, we're going to take a break. And then I want you to tell me what she said on Wednesday. <laughs> OK, so we'll take a break right now.
Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. We are back uh, talking with Louise King Lanzalotti about Judge Samuel P. King, her dad. She's the first daughter. And we're gonna, we're, we just got to the point of a love story between uh, uh, Judge King, and, and by the way, I can't call him anything <laughs> but Judge King, it's, it seems, but because of my re great respect for him over these years since I was very young, and uh, Anne King. So what, he, he asked her, will you marry me? And she said, I'll tell you on Wednesday. So uh, I think I know the answer, but what, what happened? What happened? Well, before she said yes, she did say to him, you know, I don't really want to be a war bride. And he said to her, <laughs> everyone who gets married during a war is a war bride, <laughs> in true dad humor. And so she said, oh, I guess I don't have an argument for that. <laughs> so she married him. OK. And uh, they were married during, during in the Boulder, war. Colorado. In Boulder, Colorado. Her mother took a train across the country, which apparently was very difficult to get the a ticket to come across the country during that time. But she came across for the wedding. What did he tell his parents? Do you have any idea? I mean, you I'm know, getting married. I don't know. He never heard that side of the story. They probably were fine. They were, I'm sure they were fine. Okay. All right. Well, let's. We have a photo of your dad in his uh, military uniform. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Look at, yeah. That's about 1942, I believe, that shot. Okay. He was a lieutenant. He, yeah. What did he, well, okay, so what, what do you know about what he did? I understand he, he didn't, he didn't want to disclose what, what he did during the war. He didn't he kept disclose that as a some secret, of it, yes. Military intelligence. Yeah, he did. But what, what do you know about what he did during World um, War II? I know that when they dropped the second bomb on Hiroshima, he went, he was called quickly to go to Japan, and then he toured uh, Hiroshima. He was the translator for the admirals. Uh, but he, you know, dad was pretty self effacing, so he would say, oh, you know, those people all spoke English anyway. They didn't need me. But pro possibly they needed him sometimes. Uh, I would think so, yeah. yeah, under those circumstances. So, yeah, so did he give you any idea about? Uh, being in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, or I, I, yeah. I think he was in both probably. His descriptions were leading the admiral around the, the land, and everything was flattened, and there would be a shadow with a you know, of a body basically just black, and a sign was hanging, and he asked the the admiral said, "What does that say?" And it said something like you know, groceries or something. So it was pretty devastating, I think, did to you, see that. Do you think that. he drew any conclusions from that, from his, for his life, or? Well, he, he was. He was always sort of introspective in some ways. Right, and I think, and he was, after his father and, you know, going down to myself, he was opposed to the death penalty. So I think he felt this was possibly a necessary last thing, but horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. He moved back to Hawaii after the war. Yes. What, what happened in, in his life? Where, where did he go from there? Uh, well, they were married by then. Uh, they went on to have three, three children, the three of us. Uh, Dad was an attorney. He had a lot of really interesting cases. There were some people, I think, on the Big Island who were Japanese. And when the war ended, for some reason, they thought that Japan had won the war, so they were flying their flag. And yeah, they got they were flying the Japan flag. <laughs> their flag. They said this is our flag, <laughs> and uh, they got in big trouble. So um, they didn't. No one would represent them. So my dad called them up and said, "Do you have an attorney?" And they said, "No." So he said, "I'll be your attorney. You do now." Okay. So he felt strongly about that, even though having served in in the military, he felt people needed to have some sort of a representation. Right. I think to him, war is politics. It's war is not people. Mm -hmm. I think that was really important. You know? Big difference. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what, what was his career like and as a child of Samuel P. King, what, what was your life like? <laughs> we, we, we uh, well, 
you know, we didn't know any better at first. They were our parents. They were great parents. They were so fun and so intelligent, and they would do all kinds of fun things with us, and they would travel with us. So we were very lucky. We also, when we were children, uh, had a grandfather who was governor at the time. Mm. So uh, once in a while, my grandmother would pick us up in the limousine, and we'd go get ice cream or something. And I had no idea. I mean, I just really had no clue that it was anything more than just, Normal. here comes grandma. Yeah. Right. But I guess later we started to see, oh, this is something we maybe have to live up to a little bit. You know, we felt responsible about carrying on something that, that was important. I think also we grew up being very aware of our Hawaiian heritage and how important that was. Now it's from your dad's side? Or was yeah. he, he, obviously he was telling you about that? What, what did yeah. he, what was his impressions? What was your thoughts? What was he telling you? You know, it was really interesting because he was a child of people who, who were from both sides of the argument in terms of sovereignty. You know, in terms of terms of the overthrow, sorry, yeah. And when the overthrow happened, one of his parents was really close to the queen, and the other one was part of the ministry after mm -hmm. it happened. But you know, again, these were people who loved each other, and they managed to function in a place that was changing rapidly. So I think he really recognized that change is inevitable, and you can't go back to the old ways always. But he had strong feeling, he wrote an article actually about sovereignty in which he felt that it would be great if you could have sovereignty and be an American citizen. You don't have to do one or the other. I think we have a photo of him after, after yeah, there, there he is, sort of, I guess that's his lawyer photo. That's his lawyer phase yeah. with, the, with the bow tie. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and he was, he was a lawyer in Honolulu. Yes. And, and then, then, what, what, where, where did he go from there? What was his? He was eventually, uh, he eventually became a judge in the, in the state, state judge. And mm -hmm. he would hear all kinds of cases. And he and another judge founded the family court in Hawaii. So that was a really important achievement. And I think it was the first or second family court in the country. Right, and I, I, I seem to recall being in that court at some time, but that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Then, then what happened in his career? What, where did he go from there? Uh, you know, eventually he was recruited by some people to run for governor, mm. and uh, it was the only time I think that he ran for office, as opposed to his father who ran all the time and <laughs> never lost. And uh, he did not win that election. And, and that was against uh, Burns. Like governor that, Burns, right? That was right. And governor I think Burns, uh, yeah. at that time, I think nobody expected Burns to run again. Right, right. And your dad, I think, maybe knew knew. Burns and may not have intended to be in that battle necessarily. Yeah, he wouldn't have run, I think, if he had realized that Burns might run. You, you, then your dad ran as a Republican. Yes. And uh, things have changed a lot. Things have changed a lot. He was much more liberal than the Democrats are right now. It's kind of crazy. But anyway, another topic for another time. But he often said to us that that was the best thing that ever happened to him because then he got to be a he got a, named a federal judge soon after that. And, uh, okay, so he became a federal judge, and then, then what happened to his career? He served for 40 years, I think. Yeah, as a federal judge, and what, until he, he died. Did he, he tell you anything about that, or his background, or I mean, did he tell you what was going on? Uh, he loved the opportunity to be a federal judge. He made fun of it all the time, you know. In fact, I think when the first time he got on a plane, he said, I could turn this plane around. <laughs> but he was really big on, uh, you know, not taking power too seriously. He thought, he was always saying power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So he tried to live by that, by not being that person. And uh, I, I note that he maintained his love of things Japanese Absolutely. at this time. Yeah. And we have a, a photo of him uh, playing Go. Uh, what, and as I understand this photo, uh, he, the, 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 the fellow on the left is talking with another player in Japan. I think this is a game he's playing at a distance, right? And, right. and so they're playing against each other and 
the, the fellow on the left is speaking with somebody in Japan who's telling them the moves, <laughs> and then Judge King is, is countering with his own moves right. on the go, and they're, they're right. going back, back and forth. This was before the internet, okay? Yes. <laughs> now you just yeah, go online and do it. Uh, you know, I, we don't know who won that game. <laughs> All right. Uh, apparently we have a caller oh. coming, coming in. What? Please. Life judge, fabulous member of the legal community, mm -hmm. uh, and and one one thing I've always uh, wondered about was just exactly how he took the loss when he run, ran for governor. Um, that was that was a different move for him. Um, he might have been a great governor, by the way. Um, but but question: How did how did how would that campaign go for him? Uh, how did how did uh, Louise and the other members of the family take it when he lost? How did he take it when he lost? Okay, so I'll take my answer offline. So the question is, uh, how did Judge King take the loss when he ran for governor? And uh, you know what what did he tell the family and and how did he feel about that? I mean, the the caller said that he would have been a great governor, by the way. Oh, how sweet, how sweet. I think he was initially kind of sad because he I don't know he would have loved to do it. His father had been governor. He had a lot of ideas. So I think he was a little bit unhappy about it, but um, you know he moved on pretty quickly. He didn't run again for anything. I think he, he I think he perhaps felt that, and 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 so the other question is: during the campaign, were you involved in it at all, or did you participate in the? Uh, my sister did, and my brother Becky. did. Yeah, but I was not in Hawaii at oh, the time. Okay, you were the eldest and away. No, so. I was second. My brother's oh, the okay. first brother. He's the only brother, uh, oh, first okay. and only. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so he's he's a Sam King too. Yeah, he's yeah, a Sam yeah. King. Yeah. Okay, uh, and and so uh, basically he he decided that I'm going to stick with being a judge, and that was how. Well, he, he got that offer, and he said, "Wow, yeah. this is great." So, yeah. okay. what what can you tell us about just words of wisdom and advice that that he gave you that you can give us from from him? What what type of things that. Did he say he was uh, a very wise, very wise, hu humorous man? He, I think, the dad had an amazing way of taking short, pithy statements or jokes or quotations and using them at the totally appropriate time to make a point without lecturing. So he, for example, he'd see someone and uh, the person would be doing something really ridiculous, and he would say. That's lack of poor judgment, which came from something that had <laughs> happened before. Or he'd say, you know, power tends to corrupt, or an absolute power. And he said that, those things so many times that we have a book, which I brought to show you, I'll show you later, that had, has over 100 things he used to say that we remember. So he used to say them regularly and in court and everything else. You know, he just would just pop things in at the right time. I think one thing that happened during Broken Trust that I thought was really amazing was when um, they were talking about the breaches of fiduciary duty. And Randy Broken Randy Trust Roth, was when right. it, what he, Sorry, he got the, together the and talked about the Bishop controversy, of State. Yeah. Right. And Randy Roth, his partner in crime, was talking about every single, you know, every single thing they could have done wrong, they did it, and he was listing them. And after a couple minutes, Dad said, they can't even spell fiduciary. <laughs> And that was the quote of the day. Right. It yeah. sort of said it all. So he was very good at targeting things. And also, you'd see, you'd go into court to watch, and it'd be very tense, and he would make a joke just at the right time to just make everybody just relax and stop worrying about things. He and, was very good at that. And I can tell you from my own experience that we left the court always feeling that justice and fairness and the right thing had prevailed. Oh, that's good. And, and that's how we're going to leave this right now. <laughs> we didn't have much time. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much.